<clears throat> Chapter 19, Dr. Winter's Finger There was one line in my life that I did cross freely, frequently and deliberately. This line ran from one end of the town to the other, and it had a name, DeKalb Street. That is its name in Norristown. Elsewhere, it is known as U.S. Route 202, running from Delaware up to Maine. DeKalb Street came off the bridge across the Schuylkill and ran south to north past the Reading Railroad Station, past Hartenstein pr Printing, where my father worked, past Yost Dry Goods and Sames Bookstore, and First Presbyterian and City Hall, and the YWCA and St. Patrick's Church, and on the past and on past the large stone homes of the North End and across Johnson Highway and out of town. But DeKalb Street divided more than east from west in Norristown. It also divided black from white. With few exceptions, African Americans lived to the east of DeKalb Street. So did many Italian Americans, including my grandparents, and, for a while, at 224 Chestnut, me. My first memory of a black person dates to that time when I was three or four. My mother took me with her to the dentist one day. The dentist was Dr. Winters. Dr. Winters was black. His office was in the East End. The story, as I have sometimes told it, goes like this. My mother has her dental work done while I sit off to the side. When Dr. Winters is finished, I decide I'm jealous of all the attention my mother has been getting. I want some, too. So the dentist hoists me into the chair, tells me to open wide, and checks me over. In truth, my mother and I have no specific recollection of why I wound up in the dentist's chair. My memory is clear, however, on one thing. Dr. Winters' finger in my mouth. I can feel it. I can see its dark brownness. I notice that it is a color different from my own, but that's all there is to it, a flat, casual observation. What I feel is the rightness of that thick and hard and smooth and gentle and expert finger. My mouth yields naturally to it, seems to recognize that this is the way of things. Dr. Winters never actually worked on my teeth, but to this day the sense and touch of that examination is inscribed vividly in my memory. Though I lived in the East End for several years, I had no black friends or playmates. Halfway through first grade, we moved to George Street, where everyone was white. In my class at Harfton Elementary, there was only one black girl, black student, a girl, Viola Fisher. For six years, Viola Fisher barely said a word, barely moved. Though her color made her conspicuous at Haraf, her demeanor rendered her all but invisible. Socially speaking, we white students did not see Viola Fisher. Looking back today, I can easily imagine Viola Fisher's discomfort. I imagine she often wished she could attend Washington School, deep in the East End, where almost all the students were black. I imagine she was afraid of us. And that's ironic, because in grade school, in my experience, if we went the other way, we were afraid of them. At least I was. One day when I was nine, a black boy about my age walked up to me on a school playground, made a fist, and clipped me on the tip of my chin. Fuck. That was all. The punch did not hurt me, at least not my chin nor did the boy seem interested in continuing. Perhaps he simply wanted to make a point. Perhaps it was something he needed to do, as several years later I needed to clip Joey Stackhouse on the chin. Whatever, at that moment my fear of black kids felt confirmed. I turned from the boy, trotted over to a nearby tree, knelt in the surrounding dirt, dumped out my bag of marbles, and began shooting mibs. The fear that steered me through streets and playgrounds came from a perception for which I had no words a perception I did not question. It said that black people were different from me in ways that went beyond skin color. It did not tell me how they were different, just that they were different. It is not clear how I acquired this information. I don't believe it came from home, yet somehow from the world around me, I absorbed it. There were signs everywhere. I saw, I heard, but that was all. I did not, I did not much think. I did not question. Crayola came Crayola crayons came in small and large boxes. The large box contained a pale pink-orange colored, called flesh. I did not use it. I did not often use it. After all, the pages of the coloring book were white, so it was easier to simply leave faces untouched. I never asked, who's flesh? The most popular private trash collector in town was a black man. He worked hard. In the summer especially, he became thirsty. Sometimes he would ask a business client if he could get a drink of water from their faucet, and he would show the glass that he always carried with him. He was widely commended for this. I never asked him, what do you think would happen if you didn't bring your own glass? I once attended a picnic of mixed races. Things were going along normally when the picnic was half over. 
I suddenly noticed that all the black people were gone. I did not run after them and call out, Wait, why are you leaving? When my father took me to the high school basketball games, I noticed that most of the black people sat in one section of the bleachers. I never asked, Why do they always sit together? Or, Why do we always sit together? I saw these little separations in hundreds of places in hundreds of ways, and never once did I ask why. Though I neither though I had neither wit nor grit to ask such questions, sometimes in grade school my point of view began to change. It happened when I gave up cowboys and soldiers and turned to sports. Sports, especially Little League Baseball and Biddy Basketball, brought me into a new kind of contact with African American kids. Within the structure of organized games, they ceased to be black and I ceased to be white. Instead, we were teammates, or opponents, identified by the color of our uniforms, not of our skin. The Red Sox, the Green Sox, the Colts, the Wolves. The fear in the streets did not follow me onto the sandlots and hardwood courts. On summer mornings, we came from the east end and the west end to play on the Little League field by Stony Creek. In the afternoon, the scene switched to the, ball, or to the park baseball court. It was during those long, hot days that I began to question everything I had been taught by the countless separations between black and white in Norristown, and I came to see that color was the only difference, as people, between us. And that's all it was, merely a difference, not an exclusion. One of my best friends was Louis Darden, who was black. At one time or another, Louis and I played on, a fo on football, basketball, and track teams for Harfton Elementary and Stewart Junior High. Lewis was a happy-go-lucky guy. He was truly a player, not a worker, of games. As the fastest boy at Harfton, Lewis was entered into the 100-yard dash at the Norristown grade school track and field meet. Something happened in that race, which, even more than my own winning of the 50-yard dash, remains as my most vivid memory of the day. The starter's gun went off, and the six runners bolted down the cinder track. At the halfway mark, it was clear that Lewis was not going to win. The runner at Gottwalls, Robert Lee, was well ahead of the pack, but Lewis was still in the hunt for a second or third place medal, and in the grandstand I stood and cheered him on. About twenty yards from the tape, Lewis looked to his left and right at, the cinder, at his cinder-churning comp competitors, and suddenly eased up. He slowed to a kind of whimsical prance. He threw his arms into the air, and as the other racers, others raced over the finish line, he laughed. I was stunned. I was outraged. Not that he lost, not even that he gave up. It was his attitude that bothered me most. Lottie dying twenty yards from the finish line. How dare he race and not care? How dare he lose and laugh? Didn't he know this was serious business? The championships of all the grade schools in Norristown, Pennsylvania. I, who took my sports, my baseball cards, my spelling, my life so seriously, could neither understand nor swallow it. Before all the world, Louis Darden had disgraced himself. And what was he doing about it? He was laughing. Two years later, it was I who backed off, and Lewis who cared. After school one day, a group of us were playing basketball under a telephone pole hoop outside Roger Adelman's backyard. In addition to Roger and me, Lewis Darden, Joe Portano, and a few others were there. It fell to jo jo Joe Portano to guard me, and that was a mismatch, for Joe was not much of a basketball player. Big and burly, he was more at home in the trenches of a football game. A mouse by comparison, I scooted around him and scored at will. I didn't much note his increasing frustration, until suddenly he kicked the ball into the weeds and came after me. He shoved me in the chest with the open palms of both hands. I went reeling backwards. I regained my balance and he slammed into me again, growling and scowling. And then Lewis was between us, shoving Joe Portano in the chest, sending him backward, sending him away. There was no laughing this time, no Lottie dying, no messing around. For once, Lewis Darden was all business. Lewis Darden, who hadn't cared about winning for himself, made sure I didn't lose. The boy who beat Lewis in the hundred-yard dash, Robert Lee, was the same boy who clipped me in the chin when I was nine. I'm sure he had forgotten the incident long before we met in high school and became friends. By then, my views were quite different. I was beginning to question, though not yet out loud, and as was my habit, I fantasized. I imagine Robert Lee and me back on the playground, and I imagine him again coming up to me and socking me. Only this time I don't turn away. This time I do not fear his color. This time I know that we are the same, and fear is replaced by respect. And because I respect him as I respect myself, I sock him back. And the two of us stare wide-eyed at each other, and then we nod and shake hands, and go off together to shoot some marbles. 
Here's a picture of Louis Darden in 1954. That ends chapter 19. Please look over your questions, go back into the text to answer them before moving on.